So back in 2007, I graduated high school. My parents held this graduation party for me at our home. A bunch of people from our church back then showed up. Uh, a lot of family members showed up. A lot of my friends showed up for a short time. Uh, none of you showed up, so thanks for that. No, I'm just kidding. I think some of you actually might have. Uh, there, were even, there were these folks that even drove a long, for, from a long distance to come to my party, uh, people that I didn't even know I'd never met before, but apparently they were friends with uh, my parents when I was just when I was little. Now, my older sister, Carissa, had just had her first child, Claire, just a few weeks before this. That was my parents' first grandchild, first baby born to the family. Uh, and baby Claire was at my graduation party. And I remember very, very vividly a couple who had driven a considerable distance uh, to be there at my graduation party. And I felt uh, a lot of gratitude toward them. And I wanted to express that gratitude to them. And I remember when I went to them, they said, oh, honey, we're here for the baby. And I thought, are you kidding me? Here for the baby. You drove all that way not to see me, but to see this baby in the back. And here's what I found to be true for most of that day is that a lot of the people who were there wanted to spend more time with the baby than they wanted to spend uh, with me. And I think about it, I think, you know, that baby, that, that baby stole my day, right? And here she is, she's, Claire is only, I think, two years away from graduation, her own graduation, and I'm plotting my revenge on her, right? But Cammie and I are past the baby having days, and so I need ideas if you got any, let me know, right? But uh, for real, though, I, I'm a grown man now, it doesn't bother me one bit, that doesn't show up on my radar anymore, but the reality was, that day, I was jealous of Claire, I was very jealous, I was upset, I wanted to be the central figure at my own party that day, and here this little baby was sucking up all the attention. I could have, you know, joined with everybody else and been joyful over her existence, over her life, but instead I was immature and jealous on that particular day. And today's passage that we just heard and that we're going to study here again bears a very, very uh, similar problem multiplied by infinity on the scale of importance, of course. But in today's passage, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, we see a couple of kings, one who had been politically appointed the king of the Jews and one who had just been born king of the Jews. And we're on week three of our Advent series, which is the week that we finally look at the first coming of Jesus. And it should be noted that the existence of Jesus is not uh, is not a disputed fact. The person of Jesus in the flesh isn't disputed anywhere. Every single major religion, every single major world religion recognizes that Jesus existed and they all come to terms with it in their own way. Um, early historians like the Jewish historian Josephus or the Roman historian Tacitus definitely recognized that Jesus existed at a, as a person and, and you know, they may not have come to believe in who he was, but they certainly knew he existed, and many called him a, a very good man at the very least. And the reality of Jesus' existence is something that we each must come to terms with. That's the idea in this story. We each must come to terms with the fact that he does exist. And we're going to see today that there are many different uh, responses to the existence of Jesus. And so we're going to read through this passage again. It's, it's 12 verses. We're going to read through this, and then we're going to kind of take a look at the different different reactions that we have. So you can follow along in your Bibles, you can follow along on the screen, or you can turn to the back of your bulletin insert for the, for the passage. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. 
When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now this particular story takes us from the Bethlehem prophecy that we covered last week in Micah chapter 5 to the Bethlehem birth of Jesus, the fulfillment of that particular prophecy. And now Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 through 12 is a narrative that leads with the main event. We get to the main event right away, the arrival of these wise men announcing the birth of the king of the Jews. And they're looking for Jesus essentially. And oftentimes we associate this passage with three kings, the three wise men, and that is actually a historical inaccuracy. They were likely not kings at all, though they certainly were bearing kingly gifts that that cost a pretty penny. And to be honest, there were probably more than three of them. A lot of times we say there were three of them just because there were three gifts given, but that doesn't signify much at all to us. Regardless, the news that they carried on that day was of the utmost importance. The Messiah is born, and they knew it, and they were looking for him. The prophesied king of the Jews is now alive, and this story is now seen as a tale of two kings, King Herod and King Jesus, both of whom held the title king of the Jews. And this is the setting for everything else that follows in the passage. And you're probably familiar with the common breakdown of this passage. We're not even gonna, we're not going to deviate from that at all. It's about response. Everyone mentioned in the passage has some form of a response to the news of Jesus. And so we're going to take a look, and this first response is the response of Herod, the hostility of the king. The text says that the wise men were going around asking, you know, where is he born? Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And then it says, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. Herod was troubled over this particular news. And I want you to think of this. Think of this. Herod is the king in this particular region. He was a Roman-appointed king, as the Romans held control of Jerusalem at that time, and he actually wasn't necessarily a horrible king. He was actually a very good king when it to benevolence. He was a benevolent king. He, he was known as Herod the Great. He was a great diplomat. In times of severe economic hardship, he would often give the people uh, tax breaks or give them money back that they had paid in taxes. During the great famine of, of 25 B.C., Herod melted down gold objects from the, from the palace to buy food for some of the poor people that, uh, that were under his rule. He built theaters and racetracks for their entertainment. Uh, in 19 B.C., he started reconstructing the temple in Jerusalem. He revived and built these beautiful cities and fortresses, and, and he made contributions to the rebuilding of, of Athens. The guy made some really smart political moves. He was, he was a very smart king, but even though he had been appointed king of the Jews by the Roman Senate, Herod himself was not a Jew, and I think that's where some of his fear comes in. He was only half Jewish, Herod was, and this made him afraid for his position and, and, and for his, his power. In order to accrue favor with, the, with the, the Hebrew people in Jerusalem, he married a Jewish woman who was heiress to, I think it was the Hasmonean house, uh, her name was Miriam. And he was, I think, still still suspicious, still paranoid. I think his love for his position maybe is why he did all these things, but it's also he became so troubled when the wise men came looking for whom they called the king of the Jews. He'd already been given, oh, my mic keeps going out, I think, a title had already been given to, to Herod. And so Herod's benevolence was overshadowed by his cruelty. That's what happens in the story here. Herod was a usurper taking control of the throne by force. I think from the Parthians, he would remove them uh, from, from the throne, and then he killed all of the remaining dynasty uh, from the Parthians. He had half of the Sanhedrin killed, a little over half of the Sanhedrin killed. The Sanhedrin would have been like a, uh, a Jewish senate. He killed over 300 court officers, he then had his brother-in-law killed. His brother-in-law is someone he appointed to high priest, and he had him drown, and then he threw this huge funeral, pretended like he was pretended like he was. And uh, 
Then he had his wife Miriam killed along with three of their sons and Miriam's mother because he believed all these people may have a legitimate claim to his throne. Caesar Augustus once made a joke about Herod. He said it would be, it's better to be Herod's dog than one of his children, essentially. And when Herod lay dying, he arranged for all these men in Jerusalem to be rounded up, to be placed in the Hippodrome and killed as soon as the announcement of Herod's last breath had reached the people. That way he knew there would be mourning in Jerusalem on that day. He was afraid nobody would actually mourn his death, so he ordered the deaths of all these innocent men. From the outside looking in, people would think that the Jews were mourning the death of their king. Truth be told, Herod was a madman. That's who he was. His, his, the history of his cruelty is absolutely appalling, and that's why it shouldn't surprise us at all that he was troubled upon hearing the news of this king. In fact, we know that he was more than just troubled. Herod was scheming. He gathered what information he could. The text tells us that when the, the, the star appeared where the prophesied king would be born, you know, he's, he's ask, asking these questions. When did that happen? Where is this taking place? And he told the wise men to let him know, hey, when you find this king, come back and report to me. And I just want to go worship him. That's all I want to do. And, and we know that's not at all what he wanted to do. He wanted Jesus dead. And remember that Herod was intelligent. He was an intelligent king. And, and I read once about intelligence. An intelligent person only attacks what he knows to be a real threat of his way of thinking and living. And that's why when the wise men did not return with a report for, for where this king is, Herod's barbaric cruelty peaked in his slaughter of what Matthew 2.16 says, all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in the environs from two years old and under. That's how twisted and jealous this man was. Herod's reaction to the existence of Jesus was one of hostility because if Jesus is on the throne, it means Herod could not be. And that's the same for us. If Jesus is on the throne, it means you're not. It means you are not. Basically, the writing is on the wall, right? As Herod the Great loses his greatness, Jesus increases in his greatness. I love, you know, John the Baptist talks about this. He says, I must become less, Jesus must become more. John the Baptist had the right attitude. Herod does not. Herod wants to keep his greatness. He wants to keep himself on the throne. But if Jesus is on the throne, it means your submission. It means you can't lead your own life any longer. He leads your life. It means that you must come to terms with the fact that someone is ruling over you. And that was precisely Herod's fear. He didn't want that. And so Herod represents all who are hostile to Jesus, all who oppose his rule. That's the first response we see to the news of Jesus in Matthew. Next, Matthew shows us what I would consider another poor response to Jesus' birth. We see the apathy of the priests and the scribes. Apathy of the priests and the scribes. After Herod heard of Jesus' birth, the text says that he was assembling all the chief priests and scribes of all the people, and he inquired of them where the Christ is to be born. Herod wanted more information. That's what he wanted. He needed more information. While he would gladly accept the title King of the Jews, he had insufficient knowledge of their particular Bible, of the Hebrew text. So who better to get the information from than the people who ought to know, right? The so-called experts, the scribes and the priests. They ought to know how to answer Herod's questions. Their entire existence revolves around the study of the law and the prophets, all of the Old Testament. The scribes especially would have been very well versed. I mean, their job, they, they were the, the teachers of the law, essentially. Their job was to, was to copy Scripture word for word, line for line every day. I mean, that's what they were doing. So they ought to know what Scripture says about this coming king. They were professional scholars of the word. And I imagine their knowledge of the word was very, very valuable to Herod. So Herod asked them this question, where is the Christ to be born? That's what he asks, and I think this shows us two things. One, it tells us that Herod knows that the king of the Jews is the Christ, the Messiah, the, the anointed one of Jesus. He connects those two terms, the king of the Jews and the Christ, which probably further ramps up his anxiety and his fear over his throne. And number two, it tells us that he knows there are prophecies written about this child, that this child is found in the pages of, of Scripture and that he is the long-awaited king of the people. So the scribes and the priests, they answer the question. In fact, they answer the question with the same passage that we studied last week, Micah chapter 5. 
because Micah pinpoints the location of where the Messiah would be born. And the answer is Bethlehem. That's what they tell him. They, they say, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Now notice that there are, there are a couple of differences between Matthew's version of this prophecy and Micah's version of this prophecy found in Micah 5.2. Micah says the words Bethlehem Ephrathah to pinpoint which Bethlehem it was. Matthew writes uh, Bethlehem in, in the land of Judah. Not a big deal, you know, that's not a big change. But the next line is odd. Micah originally wrote of Bethlehem who is too little to be counted among the clans of Judah. That's what Micah wrote. And Matthew seems to completely flip that one upside down and, and get this wrong. He says, by no means are, is Bethlehem least among the rulers of Judah. And many people say this is Matthew's mistake. Matthew made this mistake. And I disagree wholeheartedly. I don't think Matthew made this mistake. I don't think that's what happened at all. Micah says Bethlehem is too small. Matthew says it's not too small. He switches the words from, from ruler or from clans to, to rulers. But it was the scribes who made the mistake here. He's quoting the scribes who were misquoting scripture. All Matthew was doing was emphasizing their lack of knowledge in the scriptures here. In fact, Matthew emphasizes their screw-ups when it comes to scripture again and again in his, in his book. In Matthew 21, 15 through 16, Matthew tells of this time that Jesus was in the temple healing all these people, and the people start praising him. They're saying these things, and the scribes and the priests are listening, and they're upset about it. And they say, do you hear what they're saying? Do you hear what the people are saying, Jesus? And Jesus' response is, yes, have you never read, and then he quotes Psalm 8, but those words, have you never read, is an absolute slap in the face of the priests and the scribes because he's essentially saying, you experts of the word, do you not know your Bible? Do you not know that this is exactly what would happen? You ought to know, is what he's saying. In Matthew 15, 1 through 6, he tells the, the scribes, Jesus tells the scribes that he, they have made void the word of God by, by keeping their traditions instead of following the word. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 18, Jesus tells the disciples that he will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, the same group that we're talking about here in our text, and they will condemn him to death. This group of people, this particular group of people, will condemn the fulfillment of Scripture to death. These people who are supposed to know the Word of God inside and out, these experts, put to death the one that all Scripture points to. And the point here is that the priests and the scribes, these so-called experts, don't really know how to read their Bibles. They don't really know what they're talking about. And Matthew emphasizes that point again and again, and we see it in Matthew's account of their misquotation of Micah. Regardless, you know, they got a few things wrong, but they did get something right. They did answer correctly. The Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And it shouldn't surprise us that they, that they would at least know that answer. What's surprising is that they knew the answer, and they did nothing with it. They did nothing with the knowledge that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. They knew that he was going to be born in Bethlehem. They have now received some type of news that maybe a Messiah had been born. And beyond this, there had already been this, this, this widespread expectation of the coming of a great king. This is not biblical history. This is, this is now we get into Roman history. There were two Roman historians, early Roman historians, uh, Suetonius and Tacitus, and then there was the Jew Jewish historian Josephus, who all reported that at about the time of Jesus' birth, across the Roman Empire and even into the Orient, the time was near in which what they called a powerful ruler would, quote, acquire a universal empire. They said there was an expectation and a strong persuasion that this would take place. There was a growing feeling that from somewhere a great world leader was about to arise. And here it happens in Bethlehem. It happens in Bethlehem just as they should have known in Jerusalem's own backyard simply five miles south from wh where they were sitting. And the priests and scribes couldn't even be bothered to go check it out. Couldn't even be bothered to go check it out. I think the Apostle Paul nailed it. When he says of people like this, they're always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. They just didn't get it. 
And it wasn't just the priests and the scribes. Matthew just barely mentions the people of Jerusalem, too, here, saying that they were troubled along with Herod. But these are the same people that had been waiting for this Messiah. And they had clearly heard the news. The wise men were going around asking all of them, where, where is he? Where is he born? And yet they did nothing. They did nothing as far as the text tells us. There are lots of people like that in the world today, too. There are a lot of people even in, in churches like that, a lot of people who pack the pews who are like that, lots of people who claim to know Scripture, even if they're misquoting Scripture, and maybe even some who know Scripture quite well, but for some reason they just miss Jesus. They miss him. They're indifferent toward him. They don't care all that much, or at least they don't make enough of an effort, any type of effort, that says they would care. And the sad truth is that many can relate to that. You know, someone could say, hey, there's, there's reports of this long-awaited Redeemer over there in Wallingford. Let's go check it out, right? And some of us would say, I don't know, the game's on. Let's wait till the game's over, right? Or, or no, it's, oh, I really needed a nap today. Let's wait for that. The truth is apathy kills devotion. Apathy kills devotion. These people that we read of in the text were supposed to be devoted people to God's word, devoted people to God, and yet they didn't care. They did not care. And it goes for us, too. If you do not care enough about Jesus to pursue him or to seek him, then you can't very well call yourself a follower of him, is the truth. We cannot be as the priests and the scribes are or the people of Jerusalem because they represent all who know the faith and who do nothing. That's who they represent. Rather, our response ought to be more like the wise men. In fact, the, the wise men got it right. They're the only ones that got it right. There's an adoration concept here, the adoration of the wise men. And probably a better term for wise men is, is the magi. And there's so much mystery that surrounds these men, so much mystery that surrounds their, their story. Understand that the magi were foreigners. They were not they were not locals here. They were foreigners. They had to travel, and we don't know exactly where they traveled from, but there are some theories out there. And my favorite theory, I think the one that makes most sense, is that they maybe came from Persia or, or from, from Babylon, which is modern-day Iraq and Iran. And the reason I say that is because they clearly had some knowledge of Scripture. They had some knowledge of Scripture. They searched for the king of the Jews. That's what they kept calling him, the king of the Jews. So there's something there. They referred to his star that's what they called the star that they saw, his star, which is likely a reference to Numbers uh, chapter 24, verse 17, that says, a star shall come out of Jacob, Jacob being a parallel word for, for Israel. And the Magi's history in Scripture, we, we could trace that back to the book of Daniel if we'd like to. Daniel, after he was taken to Babylon in the exile, which would not be far off from, from Persia, was appointed chief prefect over all the Magi because he was able to interpret uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And he was also highly respected by the Magi because he successfully pleaded for all of their lives when they were unable to interpret King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And because of Daniel's high position and the great respect that they had for him, it seems pretty certain that the Magi would have learned from this prophet, from, from Daniel, about the one true God and his plans for the people through a coming Messiah. And then considering that many of the Jews that were in exile remained in Babylon after the exile and they were intermarrying with the people of the region, it's likely that Jewish messianic influence remained strong in that region up until the times of the New Testament. And that's just a theory. It's just a theory, but it would help explain where these magi came from and how they had any knowledge whatsoever of a coming king. And what's interesting is that magi, as magi, they were astrologers and astronomers, which is something that the Bible specifically forbids and mocks even. And yet through their pagan practices, they were led to Jesus. They were led to Jesus. God seemingly chose to speak to these men through the language of their passion. Before they came to pursue the king, God pursued them by revealing to them the birth of this king. And I think that's important. He made a star appear to them. And the star is an another major mystery because it doesn't have the characteristics of a normal star. It seems to disappear and move around, and, and, and it's, it's just strange. Some say that that star is, is Jupiter, the king of all planets. Some say it's just this low-hanging comet. Some say that it's God's radiance. I think that's a great explanation, which oftentimes is described as a star or, or some specific heavenly light. And both the Hebrew and the Greek words for star 
were also used figuratively to to explain a, a, a brilliance or a radiance, this, this great light. I think of the, the pillar of fire that led the Israelites through the wilderness. It's that kind of thing. And it doesn't really matter what that star was or how it came to be exactly. What matters is that clearly God produced some sort of sign that would lead these stargazing wizards to the most important person who had ever been born. They recognize Jesus as king, and they say they have come to worship him. That's what they're saying. We've come to worship him in this star. After they leave Jerusalem and are going toward Bethlehem, it reappears and goes right over the place in which Jesus was. And they saw it, and the text says that they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And I think that Matthew is at a loss for words on how to explain this here. This is a very unusual phrase to find in Scripture. He's piling up these, these superlatives to emphasize the extent of their excitement. They are so excited. They're excited to see Jesus. They're excited that they arrived. They're filled with this incredible joy over the king that they are about to meet. And I think the thing is that so much about Jesus should inspire joy. If you look at Luke chapter 2 with the shepherds, the angels said to the shepherds on the day of Jesus' birth, I bring you good news of great joy. And they describe that great joy. For unto you is born this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. His birth should bring joy. When Jesus healed someone or he cast out a demon or he forgave someone for their sins, joy was the immediate response. When the gospel of Jesus spread throughout the early church, Acts chapter 8, 8, chapter 8, verse 8, reminds us that joy followed the message. Joy followed the message. Pursuing Jesus results in joy. That's what's going on here. And why wouldn't it? Why wouldn't it? We learned last week that he is our king. He is our shepherd who cares for us. He is our peace. He is our savior. His work alone reconciles us to the Father? Why in the world wouldn't that inspire joy? After this mysterious star leads the Magi to this particular house, they go into the house, and the passage says that they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And I think that this is the single most important sentence in this entire passage, that these men fell at the feet of a child and they worshipped him. I agree with uh, Pastor J.C. Ryle, who said we read of no greater faith than this in the whole volume of the Bible. These men who worship Christ in this way. And it's a great act of faith because of who did what here. That's why it's a great act of faith. Who did what? Out of all the people mentioned in the passage, out of King Herod, out of all the people of Jerusalem, out of the priests and the scribes, it's the pagan Gentile sinners who get it right with Jesus. Isn't that strange? It's the enchanters and the astrologers, practitioners of this quasi-science religion that came to know and to worship Jesus. And the word worship here is filled with meaning. The Greek word is proskuneo, which, which carries the sense of expressing in attitude or gesture one's complete dependence on or submission to a high authority. That's the word that Matthew uses to describe what the wise men, what the Magi were doing when they saw Jesus. The attitude and gesture are both seen in the Magi as they bow down to Jesus and they present him with gifts, valuable gifts at that, gold and frankincense and myrrh. The gifts were an expression of worship given out of an overflow of, of adoring and grateful hearts. And I want you to notice just real quick that, that Matthew is very careful to say that they fell and they worshiped Jesus and only Jesus, not Mary. They did not fall and worship Mary. They gave gifts only to Jesus, not to Mary and Joseph. And Mary is not, as some would say, a part of the Christian pantheon. In, uh, I, I'm sure that the Magi were delighted to meet Mary and Joseph, but they only worship Jesus. The Magi, I think, are a wonderful representation of all who know and put their knowledge into practice. They have the correct response to Jesus. And near the beginning of this sermon, I said that we each have to come to terms with the existence of Jesus. Every person in the text was an actual person with an actual response to the news of 
of Jesus. And those responses are a perfect representation of people's responses still today. You can hate him, which is bad enough, be hostile toward him. You can be indifferent toward him, not really caring all that much, being apathetic about him, knowing of him, but, but really never caring, never pursuing, which I think is even worse probably than hating him. And if scriptural history tells us anything, is going to lead to hostility toward him anyway. Or you can respond the way that the Magi responded, in an attitude and action of worship. Pursue him as the Magi did, right? Seek him and worship him. Respond with, with great joy. Repeat their joy. Look at their joy. Their exceeding great joy and copy that, right? Feel that. Think about your relationship with Jesus right now, today. Think about it. And ask yourself, which one of these responses best characterizes your attitude toward Jesus? Does he fill you with anger or, or jealousy, knocking you off the throne of your life? Does he fill you with complacency, essentially doing nothing for you? You can't be bothered to do much for him or because of him. Or does he fill you with joy? Does he fill you with joy? Does he inspire you to worship, to bow low with whatever gift you have in hand and adoringly worship him? The truth of it is that God orchestrated a story that reminds us that this king is for you. This king is for you. From the lowly Jewish shepherds that we see in Luke chapter 2 to the wealthy Gentile sinners that we see in this passage here and everyone in between, he is your king. And the point for you and I is that we must choose whether to join the pagans and the outsiders who adore Jesus or join the elite who scorn him completely. And yet, as one author notes, God acts before and after all human choices. He has sent the Redeemer, and he reveals the Redeemer to us. And so I say, may our response be one of joy and worship all the time. Amen, church? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as always, I thank you for another faithful gathering today, another day to sing praises to you, uh, praying to you, an opportunity to give to you and, and an opportunity to hear your word. This is another day of gathering with our brothers and sisters to worship you, Lord, and, and you are worthy of all praise and all worship. And Lord, I, I think that's the point of the passage we learned from this morning, that you are to be worshiped. You have sent your son to dwell among men, to be light and to be life. And that truth should not ever escape our hearts. And so, Lord, I ask that our hearts would be softened and receptive to Jesus all the time. I ask that the truth of Christmas and the birth of the Messiah carry full weight in our lives, that we would not be like Herod, who was overprotective of his throne, that we would be not be like the, the religious elite and even the common people in Jerusalem who just couldn't have cared less about Jesus. It's my prayer that Jesus would inspire us to worship with joy. It's my prayer this morning that we would be filled with joy, even if we've known Jesus for decades. May we never lose sight or feeling. May we never become complacent or apathetic. And Lord, all glory to you for what you have done for us in the birth of Jesus, your Son, and our King. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.